Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me today in this session on government media organizations. Unlike my previous sessions, whereby we've been explaining concepts, we've been discussing examples, we've been talking about how those examples and concepts have been applied in various market environments, Today, we are going to talk more on, an, on a historical front, whereby we will discuss what are the various media organizations that belong to the government and are here in India, and how do each of them operate, what are their functions, etc. So let us begin. This session is going to cover PIB, which is Press Information Bureau, it's going to cover the All India Radio, what is uh, commonly known as Akash Vani. It is also going to cover Doordarshan, Publication Division, RNI, which is the Registrar of Newspapers of India, a very important body as we will see in the discussion later. Newsprint, import of newsprint, both of them are related to RNI and the various rules that it sets for the newspaper agencies, etc and DABP, the Directorate of Advertising and Visual Publicity. This is a government body that looks into uh, government advertisements and visual publicity material and how it should all be projected, the message that should come across, etc. So let us begin with this. Uh, to introduce this topic of uh, government media organizations, let us go back to the British times. The British government appointed press commission in India. So press commission was not an invention or a recommendation from one of the Indian leaders. It was given down to us from the British system. During the World War I, in center and in different provinces, there was a publicity board that was established. Later, the central board of information was established and which replaced this publicity board. And uh, the setting up of Central Board of Information was suggested by the then editor of Times of India, this, this newspaper, uh, who was Stanley Reed. After the World, One, uh, World War I gave over, the central, second Central Board of Information was renamed as PIB, the Press Information Bureau. After some time, the photography department of AIR became the mode of mass communication. And later, mass communication started both at the central level and at the state government level. And it later became the ministry of INB at the center and public relations department at the state level. And we very well know that with the coming of the new education policy, we have now named the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting as Ministry of Education. Now let us look at the wings of Ministry of INB. These are the wings that we, should, uh, we will be talking about when we talk about the government media organizations. So here we have Press Information Bureau, All India Radio, Dur Darshan, Publication Division, Registrar of News Departments, DAVP, Field Publicity, Photo Division, Research and Reference Division, Song and Drama Division, Directorate of Film Division, Film Division itself, the Censor Board, the National Film Archives and the National Film Development Corporation. Besides that, we also have Indian Institute of Mass Communication, FTII, Children's Film Society, and the state public relation departments which are there in all the states put together. You will be surprised that we have such a huge network of public communication and mass communication prevalent at the state level as well as in the center. But uh, they are not likely to be very visible because what they believe in is to promote the messages that have been uh, given to them, handed them down by the government. So a lot of you would not be aware of so many wings that the Ministry of INB has. This session particularly and the next session also will be devoted to making you aware of what the various government media organizations are. So let us begin with the Press Information Bureau. The main job of Press Information Bureau is to organize activities and functions related to government and make them reach the newspapers. 
It also organizes press conferences from time to time. Its head office is in Shastri Bhavan in New Delhi. And it has four main regional offices, which are located in Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, and of course, New Delhi. So all the important metropolitan towns of India. Besides that, it also has 34 branch offices. PIB is running 10 information offices in our country, which are situated in places like New Delhi, Srinagar, Jalandhar, Port Blair, Imphal, etc. PIB also prints a weekly, which is titled as Hamara Desh, which is published in 10 different languages. It is a central organization, which is a connecting link between the government and the press and works as a mode of communication. Its function is to interconnect the government and the media that serves to provide the feedback to the government on different reactions of the public as reflected in the media. It is very important for the government of any country to understand and you know, have a good control on the various reactory systems that are prevalent in the country so that they have some idea of what the, uh, you know, the audiences, the public, the people in general are thinking about regarding their policies, schemes, or whatever new ideas they come up with. The modes of dissemination of information via PIB are press releases, press notes, features, articles, backgrounders, and photographs. So uh, you have been reading about these in different courses of PGJMC. Uh, we all understand what features, articles, backgrounders are. So these are the various ways how Press Information Bureau disseminates its information to various other wings of the government or to the press and the media in general. The regional offices of the Bureau have separate websites in seven different languages, which are Tamil, Malayalam, Kannad, Telugu, Bengali, Marathi, and Mizo. Indian Broadcasting Company started the work of broadcasting with the establishment of its two centers, uh, primarily in Bombay and Calcutta, way back in 1927 during the British times. It was a private company. And after implementation of this company um, in the 1930s, India gov Indian government took the work of broadcasting under its own authority. And then it was renamed as Indian State Broadcasting. But it was closed down on 9th of October 1931 and was again started in May 1932. On 8th June 1936, its name was changed from Indian State Broadcasting to All India Radio. Post-independence, a number of states had their own broadcasting centers. The government took control of these and then AIR was later designated as Akash Vani. In 1947, the AIR had a network of six stations and now Akashwani has 197 centers. The main programs of Akashwani include music, drama, news, the timely topics of the day, the foreign broadcast services, Vivid Bharti and advertisement broadcast service, programs for particular listeners, sections of the listeners, Yuvavani, sports and school broadcast, audience research, science program, and program-related magazines. Now let us look at Doordarshan. Doordarshan started as one single center in Delhi as another part of Akashwani in 15th, on 15th September 1959. By the year 1975, seven centers were started in Delhi, Bombay, Madras, Kolkata, Srinagar, Amritsar, and Lucknow. Apart from these centers, there were also two relay centers in Masuri and Pune, which used to relay programs of Delhi and Bombay. Since 15th August 1982, Doordarshan started to present national programs along with colored programs. In the decade of 1981 to 1999, the number of transmitters rose from only 19 to 519. DD National was one of its largest terrestrial networks in the world. It covers more than 92% of the population and 82% of the land area of the country. DD News, this is the only bilingual news channel in the country which was launched on November 3, 2003. DD Sports, 
was launched on 18th March 1999. Didi Bharti was launched on 26th January 2002. Telecasting of programs is also prevalent which is on art, literature and culture. An 8 hours loop has been introduced that's telecast thrice a day. So 8 hours a series of program goes on then it is repeated one more time and then another time. So thrice the same loop is uh, telecast. DD Urdu is a state owned television channel broadcasted from Doordarshan in Delhi. The channel was launched in 2006. The channel is available in India and in parts of Asia and Gulf countries. It was established on 15th of August 2006 following a governmental commitment in the parliament and this commitment was made in response to the unstarred question uh, number 2026 regarding the launch of Urdu channel. DD India, this channel was launched on 14th March 1995. It was earlier called as DD World but was renamed as DD India in 2002. Now we look at the publication division. It is a repository of books and journals for highlighting matters of national importance. Every year it publishes more than 200 books. Apart from printing policies of government, it publishes Ajkal, Bal Bharti, Kurukshetra, Yojna, Indian and Foreign Review, Bhagirathi, etc. So these are some of the very important journals that are published by the publication division. The subjects range from art, history, culture, biographies of eminent people, land and people, flora and fauna, children's literature, science and technology, and Gandhian literature to work of reference, like India of reference manual. The division also brings out selected speeches of the presidents and prime ministers of India. The division, which has descended in some ways from the department set up by the British government to conduct propaganda against the Axis powers during the World War II, it brought out periodicals in not only English, Hindi and Urdu, but also in some foreign languages like Persian, Arabic and Russian. In 1943, it was shifted under Ministry of Information and Broadcast and was named as Publication Division in the year 1944. Apart from books, the division publishes 21 periodicals in English, Hindi and regional languages. Some of these publications are Bal Bharti, which is a popular children's monthly Bal Bharti magazine in Hindi, published regularly since 1948. Ajkal, the prestigious literary magazine Ajkal in Hindi and Urdu covers different aspects of Indian culture and literature. The magazine has entered into its 68th year of publication. Yojna, the flagship publication, seeks to carry the message of planned development to all sections of the society and serve as a forum to promote a healthy discussion. Kurukshetra. This is again a leading magazine on the rural development issues and it enjoys one of the highest circulation in its category of magazines. Employment news. This is the more popular kind of publications that people generally know about since this entire uh, publication is dedicated to advertisements on employment related activities and jobs. It was launched in the year 1976 with the objective to provide information on the recruitment vacancies of the government under both state and centre. The next in line is RNI, the Registrars of Newspapers of India. The government body was set up on 1st July 1956. It was established as per the recommendations of the first press commission report in the year 1953. It further involved the amendment of the Press and Registration of Books Act 1867 and included the guidelines and functions of RNI. RNI has been responsible for carrying out both statutory and non-statutory functions. We will discuss these. Statutory functions of RNI. One, it compiles and maintains a registrar of newspapers which has all the important details about all the newspapers. 
It also issues a certificate of registration for a valid declaration. It annually reviews the financial statements sent by the publishers of newspapers as per Section 19D of the Press and Registration of Books Act. It is also informing the district magistrates about availability of titles to intend the publishing for filing declarations. And it also ensures that newspapers are published as per the guidelines and rules of Press and Registration of Books Act 1867. It also verifies the circulation claims made by the publishers in their annual statements. It submits to the government on or before 31st December each year a report containing all available information and statistics about the press in India. Looking at its non-statutory functions, one of the important non-statutory functions is formulation of newsprint allocation policy. RNI is responsible for developing the guidelines and issuing eligibility certificate to the newspapers for importing newsprint. It further helps in the import of any machinery etc which is required for printing processes. Earlier there was a huge debate on how much should a newspaper uh, owner be allowed to bring in the newsprint. So there had to be some specific guidelines on the eligibility certificate which came to be the criteria for getting the newsprint imported from other countries. So newsprint is something that we don't make in a large quantity in the country so it needs to be imported. So the formulation of this newsprint allocation policy was very important because it could uh, amount to the difference between democracy and monopoly. This is because any newspaper owner who has the capacity to bleed in terms of money and in terms of advertising revenue production will obviously be able to buy more, more amount of newsprint as compared to a smaller newspaper. As a result, this smaller newspaper would suffer because the price of the newsprint would increase and then these people will not be able to buy it. As a result, there will not be a democratic way uh, of functioning in the media and in the press. So this formulation of newsprint allocation policy was one of the very important uh, aspects of RNI. Then title verification. As per the provisions of PRB Act of 1867, RNI is also responsible for the verification of the titles of the newspaper. This is done to ensure that no two newspapers have the same title of the same language or uh, belonging to a different publication house. In case of foreign titles, a valid license of agreement is to be presented if the titles uh, hold any kind of similarity. The magistrate is the sole authority of informing the publication houses to revise the titles upon verifying from the registrar of the press. Annual statements under Section 19D under PRB Act of 1867 uh, states that all the publishers are supposed to be submitting an annual statement under the Registration of Newspapers Central Rules 1956. There is penalty for non-submission of uh, uh, the annual statement as well as for incorrect submission because for other than uh, penalty in terms of money for incorrect submission, there is also a jail term for six months. In the annual statement, the publisher includes the following details. One, the number of published copies per day on an average. Two, the average number of copies distributed, which is the sales figure and the complementary copies, etc. Three, the publisher also publishes over 2000 copies which ha has to be countersigned against the description chartered accountant or qualified you know, article tester. Small newspapers with subscription of less than 2000 copies have been exempted from this rule. Educational institutions and religious committees have also been exempted from this rule of RNI. There are a number of educational institutions as well as religious institutions which bring out publications of various kinds. So this rule is not applicable to them. 
uh, RNI will use these newspapers for their internal communication and uh, rather than for sale. So wherever any kind of publication is coming out, which is more in the form of a house journal or a newspaper, which is meant for internal consumption only, there this rule is not applicable. According to the rules, press registrar has the right to check any description submitted by any publisher at any point of time. Another important aspect that RNI deals with is the newsprint. The current policy guidelines regarding um, obtaining newsprint and the use of newsprint are as follows. Not less than one third of the annual production of indigenous newsprint will be reserved for small and medium newspapers. This is directly connected to the policy that we were just talking about. How much the certificate which allows them to buy a certain quantity of newsprint will depend on the total annual production which is being imported in the country and the one third of it which is reserved for small and medium newspapers so that they can also survive in the market. And then import of newsprint is allowed to actual users. Looking at the import of newsprint, any registered newspaper is eligible to import newsprint from outside. So all you need is that your publication should be registered with the RNI after which you can import newsprint. The publication house is required to have an eligibility certificate issued by the RNI, the policy of which we have just discussed. The import of printing machinery or material other than the newsprint, uh, when we talk of printing material and printing machinery, what the rule says is. The procedures and guidelines for import of items are given in the handbook of rules and procedures for import and export, which is uh, issued by the Ministry of Commerce. The press registrar helps as an advisor to the ministry in terms of importing technology and resources from international markets. The publication house also has to pay the required custom duties to import foreign technology in the domestic market. The distributor or proprietor of a paper ought to submit yearly returns by 30th of April, which is the year ending, financial year ending, for the period finishing 31st March, showing the amount of imported newsprint obtained and utilized amid the pertinent periods. The profits ought to be properly checked by a chartered accountant and inability to present the profits in time or accommodation of false data will preclude the paper for validation of certificate of registration for import of newsprint. So if there is any kind of um, fallacy in the previous year's newsprint production and the usage and the import, then the certificate for getting it further in the preceding, in the succeeding years might stand cancelled. Now let us look at the DAVP. This is the Directorate of Audio and Visual Publicity. DAVP came into existence at the time of outbreak of World War II. The Directorate of Advertising and Visual Publicity is the nodal agency to undertake multimedia advertising and publicity for various ministries of Government of India and departments of Government of India. Some of the autonomous bodies also route their advertisements through DAVP. As a service agency, it endeavours to communicate at grassroots level on behalf of various central government ministries. So basically DAVP is a body which will propagate the messages of the government amongst the people, be it policy matters or be it schemes or be it any kind of uh, social and behavioral change communication, etc. But at the same time, autonomous bodies can also uh, make use of DAVP, the vehicles of DAVP to, um, you know, spread out the message that they want to. But of course, when we compare the vehicles and tools of DAVP to those of private advertising agencies, we very well understand that they, on the DAVP's front, it is more limited in nature. But when we talk of the private, it is much more expensive to advertise with the private agencies, newspapers, media, etc. 
Now, what are the channels of communication that Directorate of Audio and Visual Publicity makes use of? One is press advertisements, the advertisements that appear in newspapers and magazines. Public exhibitions, there are always exhibitions that are being held at important places in the city, which can be uh, supported by DAVP. Outdoor promotion in terms of posters, banners, wall paintings, etc., trying to propagate hygienic habits or culture or some such thing. Booklets and pamphlets, publicity through audiovisual medium. So, audiovisuals could mean videos or they can also mean films, short films. Distribution of material for publicity and publicity through, of course, the digital media because digital is the latest in thing when it comes to reaching the uh, audience in a more segmented manner. DAVP ensures that advertisements uh, designed are focused in sensitizing the public about the prevalent social concerns within the society. It is an advertising agency for the central government. It ensures that the public is informed about the necessary information through printed materials and through various other promotional material. Uh, it also helps in promoting grass rule uh, policies by devising strategies for advertisements and promotion. So you would often find that villages and uh, the rural belts where the mainstream media and even the digital media does not find its reach, DAVP and its vehicles reach there because the idea is to propagate the policies or uh, the behavioral changes that they are looking at on a national level. So it is important to reach the unreached. It is important to reach the rural background, uh, the rural uh, segments of the population, which remains largely untouched by what is happening with the mainstream media. So the idea is to promote those rural, the policies in the grassroots level by devising strategies for promotion and advertisements and public relations. DAVP has a network of 32 field exhibition units spread all across the country. So now these field exhibition units look into the propagation and promotion of various messages and also create exhibitions of various kinds in order to promote those messages. They act as an interconnection between the government and the public on issues related to health and education AIDS awareness, gender equality, etc. So whatever are the more important kind of issues that the country is facing socially, economically, politically, uh, what DAVP does is to bridge the gap between the common man, the unreached population of the country and the government which has figured out that these policies or these rules and regulations must be followed by people at large in order to overcome say for example COVID-19 or polio or any such thing. So the issues which are pertaining to health, which are pertaining to education, which are pertaining to uh, AIDS, HIV awareness, gender equality and all other different kind of violence against women, uh, women's feticide, so on and so forth. So whatever social issues, whatever social ailments the society is suffering from, DAVP brings out promotional material and communication to the large masses in order to you know, encourage positive behavior pertaining to them all. So this is all for this session. And we, in the next session, which begins in five minutes time, we will continue with more government media agencies. Stay tuned with us. See you again in five minutes. Thank you.